So the Open Learning Initiative is a research project at Carnegie Mellon. We're about 14 years old now. Uh, at about the time that MIT was starting the uh, Open Courseware project, which focused on access, you know, taking any kinds of materials that are available and faculty are willing to share, putting it on the web and uh, letting anyone get access to it. CMU engaged with the Hewlett Foundation around a project to consider effectiveness. So not merely do we, can we put materials out there, but can we put out materials that demonstrably enact instruction for independent learners. Our goal in this case is to take areas of core expertise and strength at CMU, so deep understanding of cognitive psychology, science of learning, uh, of how human beings use computers, uh, and combine these things to build online learning environments uh, designed in a scientific way, and then evaluated in a scientific way after the fact. So we're very rigorous in our design process, I mean, ensuring that we're doing our best to either follow current learning science principles or to recognize places where um, if learning science is young, might not be up to the task of uh, what the specific domain challenge is that we're trying to teach. So in those cases, we'll form a new hypothesis and test it get the environments out there into the world um, and get them used. And so, though we originally were looking at supporting independent learners, um, we found out pretty quickly that, yes, if you take this careful design approach and focus on iterative improvement, you can good, build good resources for independent learners. But those same materials in the hands of an instructor become pretty powerful. And so our mission now is to support both independent learners but also classroom instruction by building uh, learning environments that capture data, use that data to drive feedback loops either to faculty, to students, uh, and ideally back to course developers who can improve the materials. And in the aggregate, sending this data back into the learning science community so we can improve our understanding of how human beings learn. So as I mentioned, we have uh, roughly 22,000 students for this fall semester who are making use of uh, OLI courses in an academic setting. Um, and I think that represents seven to 800 course sections. Now a section can be anything from someone homeschooling who has two or three students to um, we have a section at uh, UC Davis with over a thousand students in it. And so that measure of sections is a little bit nebulous. So, I mean, on a very practical level within OLI, we, uh, we, we create and improve uh, online learning environments and we serve these out to students. Uh, this fall has been a record year for us for enrollments. We distinguish between uh, academic enrollments and independent learners. So an independent learner, someone who just needs to brush up on their statistics skills, wants to learn biology, and so they can come to our website and access our materials in an open and free way. Um, that was part of our original grant and it's part of our larger vision for uh, expanding the community of use and access. But we also talk about academic use. So I'm a faculty member and I want to use an OLI course, either supplement my instruction or in many cases uh, to use it as a textbook replacement. Um, so you know, this semester we're seeing, last I checked, uh, about 22,000 uh, individual students making use of different OLI courses. And we have uh, 20 to 25 full courses, um, then an additional 20 mini courses. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the ongoing maintenance and care of those is something that occupies us. Uh, along the way, we're also creating some new courses. I've uh, been collaborating with some of the, uh, the Department of Labor grantees and some colleagues at Stanford, and just finished a um, Ka Hims course. So, it's the uh, Certified Associate in health information management systems, um, so workforce credential, and we've got uh, what is now a <coughs> roughly a 20, it will, it will be the equivalent of a 20 week uh, preparation course in that space. Um, we've been doing a lot of work in making use of this data, so we talk a lot about analytics. Um, right now the learning dashboard that's been implemented inside the system is uh, built off of the work of a CMU faculty member named Marsha Lovett. It's been, I think, drawing a lot of attention and continues to drive a lot of the discussion in this learning analytics space, uh, both open and closed. And we're looking beyond that to what does a larger model for learning analytics look like? How can we take that analytic approach and use it to drive course improvement, to use it to better understand learning design? Uh, so these are other areas that we're working on. So currently OLI actually sits outside of the academic department. We report to the Vice Provost for Education. Um, and it's, it's a pretty good question, right? So because we're trying to span so many different parts of the university, we had originally uh, sat under the Office of Technology for Education. Um, and about two years ago, uh, OTE, called the office, was merged with our Center for Teaching Excellence, the Build a New Organization, the Eberly Center for Teaching Excellence and Educational Innovation. Um, 
which I think was uh, pretty exciting from our perspective. You know, this recognition that how you use the technology and how you uh, teach effectively are not separate things, and that any time we're talking about technological use, we ought to be talking about effectiveness. Um, and so as things moved around there, OLI came to sit uh, directly under the Vice Provost for Education. And I think we're still considering where our long-term home should be. Um, there have been some changes at Carnegie Mellon over the past year or so. So we have a new president. Um, and he's been looking at the landscape and recognizing that because CMU doesn't have a college of education, there's no central home academically for this kind of work. And uh, absent that kind of home, we've ended up having smaller projects grow up um, in silos, sort of independent of one another. And so we've got a, an amazing educational research group called PEER. We've got the Pittsburgh Science of Learning Center. Uh, OLI has been very successful, and lots and lots of smaller projects. Um, and so what he's proposed is that giving these different smaller projects uh, a, a common focus, both in how we collaborate out with the world, and how we perform research, and in how we use this new work to inform instruction at our own institution uh, should be a, a strategic priority for the organization. And he's um, created what we're calling the Simon Initiative as a forward face for this. And so we're still figuring out how those pieces come together. But when we think about those elements of collaboration, of research, and of uh, instructional practice, OLI sits pretty clearly in, in the middle of those. And so I've uh, been pretty active in that process shaping out. So I think it's it's a couple of ways. I mean, we have a, uh, what we think of as an introductory webinar. You're just getting started with OLI. Let me walk you through the process. But a lot of that ends up being mechanics. How do I create a section? How do I get my students to enroll? How do I find the dashboard? Once uh, faculty have had a chance to try that piece out, and maybe even teach a little bit with the materials, we have a second tier uh, webinar that talks a little more about how do you effectively integrate these resources into your practice. Um, it's an area that I wish we were able to make a bigger investment in. I think that the integration of technology into teaching and instructional practice is, is huge. It's not been studied enough, and we don't, we don't know how to support people in doing it. Um, that's really apparent in the K through 12 space, but we're seeing it in the higher ed space as well. Uh, but I, I think that the last, I mean, we have a help desk. People, you know, people can mail in, get some answers. But I think maybe the most important thing that we've done uh, on the dashboard side has been to take a very careful process, uh, design a process. Um, had a very talented designer who has uh, not just experience on the visual design and information architecture side, but also has deep experience in the educational technology field. So uh, Judy Brooks was the uh, designer for this project. Um, and you know, from her perspective, if we're not building a dashboard that most faculty can use with only a minimal amount of orientation, then we probably haven't built the right tool. And, and I think that um, her touches on design combined with a pretty thoughtful design committee around the dashboard have led to a tool that's been uh, pretty nice. thoughtful and pretty effective. Okay. Um, so when we talk about learning, really when we start talking about building a course, mm -hmm. the, the, there are a number of things that we do that I think of as the OLI development process. Part of this involves bringing together a team to develop these environments. I think th this is actually a fairly important distinction that sounds trivial at first, but when you think about the normal online course development process, it's often a single faculty member who's saying, I want to put my course online. Um, what we're going to do is take that faculty member, or hopefully a group of faculty members who have both domain expertise and teaching expertise, say, so, you know, we, we want to honor and recognize that expertise, but also recognize that there's additional inputs that we need, and so we want to pair you up with learning scientists, human-computer interaction specialists technologists, um, learning engineers. And so as a team, recognize that all of these different expertises have something to do with the development process. First thing in that development process is to really clearly articulate student-centered, measurable learning outcomes. And we use those outcomes to carefully drive what it is we're building out. Ideally, an OLI course looks like a set of outcomes and a series of activities that will support students in achieving those outcomes. Um, where those activities are things that are asking students to do something in an active way, answer a question, solve a problem, or do something in some other way that allows us to give the student feedback, you know, either appropriate feedback when they're correct, identifying and helping them clarify misconceptions where they're wrong, and giving them the chance to ask for help. And so, it's those student interactions, whether it's in these low stakes types of learn by doing activities or self-assessments or higher stakes you know, quizzes or exams that we use to drive um, you know, some of these analytic measures. And so each of these measures, we, what we're predicting is 
student success on or mastery of an individual learning outcome as composed of any of the smaller sub-skills we might have uh, factored out. Um, but we also try to keep ourselves honest by doing evaluations with third-party assessments. Um, so I think the OLI study that gets the most press currently is the, the Accelerated Learning Study. So this was done in 2008 with our statistics course. And the, um, you know, the idea was that we were taking a group of Carnegie Mellon students, half of whom were going to be taking the statistics class in a traditional way, half of whom were going to be using the OLI stats course to support their instruction. Uh, both of these were given a pre and a post test using the chaos test, uh, the, the fairly standard third party assessment instrument. And um, the findings that were pretty remarkable, you know, what we found were that the students using OLI materials were achieving higher outcomes, uh, at least according to this exam, and they were doing it at about half the time. So it was a shorter semester and within that shorter period of time they were studying less and they were attending class less. Uh, we went back a year later and checked and in fact they were retaining this information as well as their traditional peers. Um, and so that's one model for how we might consider outcome achievement. A different one sits underneath the analytics platform. Um, so the learning dashboard has a cognitive model of uh, the relationship between the learning objectives, the sub-skills, some parameters surrounding those of you know, how difficult we expect the skill to be to achieve, what kind of background knowledge students have, how uh, how long of a period of time it should take to, to acquire this skill. And that model gets tuned on a regular basis from the data that's coming in. So students are going to come in and interact with these learning activities. Um, in a live way, we're going to use this combination of the cognitive model and a prediction engine. Uh, in this case, it's a Bayesian uh, hidden Markov model based engine to predict mastery. But you know, once every six months or so, we also want to take that data in the aggregate and run it through a tuning process to see if the parameters that we have to assess or predict are appropriate or where they need to be tuned. Um, and so this is a different way to consider outcome achievement. A third tool that we use comes to us from the Pittsburgh Science of Learning Center. This is uh, their data shop tool has a number of different tools, but the one that um, I think is easiest to explain is a tool called Learning Curves where we are taking student interactions against a specific subskill and uh, charting out how much assistance or how many errors they're making um, in the achievement of this skill. So what you expect is that the first time a student encounters a problem for a specific skill, they should make a lot of mistakes. But subsequent exposure, we should, we should see a decrease. Um, when you combine these specific skills, or knowledge components is what they're referred to as uh, in data shop. So when you combine these multiple uh, knowledge components, with real student performance, um, some of the tools in DataShop are able to show you a predicted set of student performance versus actual student performance. And so when those are diverging, um, and what we know is that there's a place there where we need to make some adjustments that either our learning model is off base and needs to be uh, you know, compressed or changed, or the activities that we have to support this knowledge component are not appropriate. That we either need to provide more scaffolding in some cases, or maybe the question's not useful or necessary. And so we try to take a diverse approach to understanding how students are achieving the learning outcomes. Um, and I guess you know, there's, there's another important feedback loop in this, which is on the qualitative side. We've got faculty out there making use of these courses, and they're able to give us additional insight on what's effective and where they see their students struggling. So this is actually an area we're trying to put together a proposal on. Um, you know, this is what I think of as design analytics, that we have various philosophies and methodologies for informing how we put these different components together. Some studies out there that have measured effect size, and so some tools to say, you should be adding some more examples here, or you know, your course might benefit from uh, some learn by doing activities. Combined with, and we know that the effect size of this kind of work has been X or Y in the past, right? So I can really tell you, you're probably busy. If you're trying to make a, you know, a round of improvement to your course, but you have limited time, this is the thing you could do that would be most effective. Uh, so anecdotally, I think that the more opportunities we provide students for active practice in which they can receive targeted feedback in the process of problem solving is, is the most important thing we can do. Um, the ideal OLI course is you know, the platonic ideal, not, the, not one that exists, would consist simply of learn by doing activities that gave students feedback and gave them the opportunity to ask for hints. 
Um, realistically, that's not an environment that you can build. That you know what you need to do or have some pretty serious specialized activities that are domain specific, then lots of smaller opportunities for students to practice and answer simpler questions, interspersed with expository types of content, text, videos, examples, worked examples, and so that simple process um, combined with lots of embedded uh, you know, the assessment opportunities, you know, learn by doing or otherwise. Yeah, so I think. Um, yeah. So the data shop model informs the creation of the uh, at the, the creation and refining of the skills model that feeds the dashboard. So in these cases, we have them coming together. Um, generally, what we're looking for when we're trying to do some iterative improvement on courses is uh, to provide inputs for a development team, right? So it's very rare, and I actually wouldn't expect the analytics system to say very specifically. This is a, you know, these five questions about box plots are bad and you need to come up with a simpler set of questions, right? What we expect from the analytics reports is that it can highlight for this team, here's this knowledge component where students are underperforming, or here's a set of assessments where students are assessing at a much lower level than their practice uh, attempts would have indicated. You now need to drill in to make a hypothesis on why this isn't working make some modifications to the course. Now let's get it back out in front of more students to see if this round of improvement has uh, helped to support that hypothesis or whether we need some additional approaches. Um, as I said earlier, I think you know, learning science is pretty, uh, pretty young. We're still in early days. And so uh, the, the, the phrase learning analytics brings to mind some very nice, highly polished set of tools that we can apply very easily. But you know, in, in many cases, we're out at the bleeding edge. We're building this stuff with you know, spreadsheets and scripts and things that don't lend themselves to easy combination. So the learning process. dashboard is a real-time process. Um, so this is something that faculty can use to you know, sort of identify which outcomes do students seem to be doing well in, where are they struggling, and then from this, what misconceptions should they be addressing. So it's really a tool to help them think about how to best spend their classroom time, what are the activities that they might be best uh, spent doing. But the uh, iterative improvement analytics tend to happen at a much uh, slower pace. So, you know, like I say, maybe uh, once a year, twice a year, we'll be able to go back to either refine models or identify places for course improvement. Part of that is governed by um, the academic calendar. Part of that, frankly, is governed by funding. Um, you know, one of the strengths of being a research organization is that we can look for external funding. One of the weaknesses of it is that we're entirely dependent upon external funding. Um, and we know that this approach to course development is incredibly effective, but we also know it's pretty expensive. This is a very uh, intense process that requires a lot of uh, human beings and technology investment. So for this dashboard, um, the faculty are going to be given a view into for each of the uh, learning objectives. Um, we've got a student aggregate view. So we're assuming, you know, how many students are in the green, we would predict they'd be successful. How many are in yellow, struggling? How many are in the red? Um, who really just don't seem to be getting it, and then how, what pop, part of the population is in the gray. They have not made enough uh, interactions, or we don't have enough data to make a prediction. From this view, a faculty member can select a specific learning objective and drill down to see what are the individual subskills that constitute this objective, what is the student success rates against those subskills, and if there are ones that really seem to be standing out, drill down a step further to see what are the questions that are contributing to that skill, what are the kinds of answers students are giving? And this is the place where we really are trying to support more effective use of human creativity and ingenuity to identify, oh, I, I understand now these are the misconceptions my students are exhibiting, and I, and I can walk into the class and do some different things. Um, I think in addition to that, we try to provide some information around who's been actively engaged and who hasn't been. Um, you know, sometimes it's just a simple uh, completion score, how many activities have you worked through. We've got this notion of an open response, you know, that there are things that are not easily categorized or easily uh, summed up on the quantitative side, and we want faculty to be able to go in and see what student free text responses look like. Um, and then finally, we provide a separate view into the high stakes assessment. 